This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Mario Marco's family suffered unspeakable tragedy during the Iran-Iraq War in 1980. Mario became a soldier at the age of 15, but eventually had to leave his homeland and came to America, where he wound up serving in the U.S. military and found himself back in the Mideast, where injuries ended his military career. Both tragic and inspiring, he shares his story in his book, The Wounds of Life. Um, for me, it was the war. Um, I'm originally from Iran, came to United States in 2000, joined the military, and the rest was history. While when I was in Iran, unfortunately, in 1980s, we got war with Iraq. I was a young kid, 13, 14 years old. And first day of the war, I lost my dad. He was a maintenance working at the oil refinery in Oil in my refinery. Town. Yes, in the city of Abidan, which is border of Iraq. And also, we didn't have a time to bury the guy. That's how bad it was. Um, more than two weeks constantly bombardment my city. So many people die. My family have to evacuate it but it was the harshest way you can think of. Even the Iraqis uh, at the time, any civilian vehicle passing through actually hit them with the RPG or with missiles. So they have to go halfway with the vehicle, other half to the safe place, just walking. And can you imagine that how difficult it was, you, you know, your mother with your you know, little kids and a bunch of civilians have to pass by. We, me and my brother, have to stay behind to protect our land and the city. Close more than three or four months, we was surrounded, per se, or you can say the siege, I guess, uh, by Iraqi military. And um, thanks to Iranian Navy SEALs and us, we actually break the siege, and uh, finally they go back to their border. And it was hard. Then um, I joined the military right there at age 15. So uh, everybody says that, uh, pretty much like a, a, a child soldier. Uh, still, I remember um, they gave me a gun. The gun was bigger than me. <laughs> it, it was harsh. It was hard. You know, I don't know how to explain it. The war is not something you want in your door, doorstep. But unfortunately... When it happened, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your loved one. You have to protect your your soldiers, your country. And that was my call. And um, fast forward, 10 years later, I was injured during the first Gulf War because the uh, United States and uh, Iraq go to war. And some of the Iraqi forces was came to our border. And we have to go protect our, uh, our land. So we told him, hey, you guys need to go back. And unfortunately, uh, my driver at the time did not familiar with area. We accidentally go to the Iraqi minefield and our vehicle hit the mine. And I was badly injured and uh, unfortunately lost my driver. And then uh, I uh, later on, they flew me back to Germany. So I got fixed, I got better, and I found that was the true of the Iranian regime is. And when I came back home, I told them, listen, this is what's going on. They're not telling the truth. And um, so they have, they're having a good time in Europe, but meantime, we have to pay the cost. So I resigned on my post. And a couple of years later, I, um, I came to the United States. And a um, year later, I joined the U.S. Army. And... Um, um, they sent me back to Iraq and Afghanistan, the place I actually, actually I left because of the war. I go back again. So you can imagine uh, how difficult that was. So after I came home and medically discharged, my therapist told me the best therapy for you, just write whatever comes to your mind. So I started you know, writing and, and some of my story was so horrible. I made actually the psychologist cry. I don't know when your best person, your your coworker, your soldier, your friend, uh, die in front of you, and there is no way you can help it. How do you deal with this? It it wasn't easy to deal with. You know, back injuries and and a, and a TBI, the head drama, 
shrapnel in your bag, you know, all this stuff happened to you. And then uh, God bless this uh, man and woman and working in a VA hospital, man, they, they do their best. And then gradually uh, I get better. And um, by the grace of God, I, I write this book and I was thinking, you know, what, I just want to bring some spotlight to the veteran in whole. Hey, what happened to these people when they come home? And just try to make a difference if I could. Well, I don't know how you can't make a difference, Mario. Just keep trying to get your book out there. Keep trying to talk to as many people as you can. Thanks for sharing your story. Ken Rutledge is becoming a regular on the Page Publishing Book Club, a history buff who spent four years in the military and once considered an FBI position, gives his alter ego Jim Huntington a life as a fearless CIA operative. The Code is a follow-up to his first book, More Than a Lifetime, the second of a five-part series. All right, Ken, bring us up to date. In More Than a Lifetime, Jim's family was eradicated. His uh, brother, parents, and then his wife and two children because of Jim's brother's ties to the CIA and what they thought that uh, Bobby knew, uh, which went all the way up to, to the president. For that reason, Jim went back into the CIA for vengeance and uh, found out that he wanted to change the, the, the system and became a, a proponent for the code, which was love of uh, God, duty, honor, and country. Then we go to the code, which is uh, sometime later, and it starts out with the mold in the CIA, uh, and he's brought back into the CIA because a very good friend of his was uh, executed. And this takes place in, in North Korea. So when he gets into the, into the code, then it's more political, more adventurous, on an international scale. His quest is no longer for vindication of his family. It's for love of country, which is which comes up. That's why the next one is, is titled For Love of Country. While he's doing this, uh, he makes a pledge to his wife and his friends that uh, if he makes it out of this, that he is going to go and run for the Senate. So we begin the code with Jim being drawn back into the CIA because of the death of uh, a very good friend of his. And the United States government is involved in the production and selling of anthrax. And this has been sold to Iran and to, to North Korea. So Jim is, is fighting within a system to find out who's behind this, at the same time trying to locate the uh, manufacturing facility in, uh, in North Korea. And then there's two children that witness the death of his friend, and they are now held in prison. So it's, it's freeing the children, destroying the, the anthrax, and retrieving the formulas, and also the uh, toppling of the ruthless uh, general who um, works for Kim Jong-un. So there's one group of men who divide into three different uh, attack groups. And it deals with their three of climatic adventures uh, in North Korea. All right, Ken, next up for love of country. Looking forward to it. Lee Tress M. Burris was an elementary school teacher in Delaware for 20 years before she was forced to retire. So she decided to write about her four-year-old great niece. And now she's published a children's book entitled I Am Me, A Wish for Snuggles. She is such a curious and creative and precocious little girl. She's fun. <laughs> and I am just so shocked at some of the things that she comes out with. It amazes me. And I was like, you know what? Cheyenne needs a book written about her. And I think because she has such a positive self-concept, this book will be great to show children that no matter what color you are, what status you are, or what gender, you can have positive self-esteem at a very early age. Um, the story basically is a rhyming story that teaches children to love themselves and basically it involves some of the actions that Cheyenne does. She loves to read, she picks out her own clothing, what she likes to wear, and how she poses <laughs> because she's very confident in who she is. It's a fun, loving, rhyming story, um, how she feels, how she thinks, 
and how she sees the world. Uh, but she sees everything positive. Um, the beginning is, my name is not Anna, Clarissa, or Jane. My name is Cheyenne, and I am not plain. And some of the things she, she does, she can read brilliantly. She's beautiful, and that she can be anything that she wants to be. How she likes her chocolate-covered skin. How she likes her light brown eyes and her big, toothy smile. How she likes rainbows. Um, how she likes skirts, socks, and dresses. How she likes her body, her skinny arms and legs, and how she loves her best friend, and her name is Meg. And then uh, one of the parts that I really like, I would love myself if I was white, yellow, red, or blue. Loving yourself is all about liking you. Really great self-esteem this little one has. Yes. Nothing deters her from being the child that she is. Even though she's four, I can imagine her saying this. I love myself, and I don't care what people have to say. I live morning, afternoon, and night in this body, and I am okay. That's the way Cheyenne is. She doesn't care about how people feel about her. She does what she does because she knows who she is already at four years old. (laughs) Have you read this book (laughs) to other kids? Oh, yes. Oh, they love it. They love it. It's a big seller. And um, recently, uh, I have been requested to do assemblies at schools, and I talk about self-esteem with, with, with kids, and then I read my book, and they love it. So I, I've been doing assemblies at schools, and with the assemblies, um, I do book signings there. Also, I have book giveaways through Amazon.com. Well, I'm on Facebook, too. I've just started utilizing Facebook because I'm a very low-tech person, but somebody told me that if I really want my books to get out there, um, social media is it. You may be low-tech, but you're high-energy, lady, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. You know what? It's been a long journey from this point because the reason why I stopped teaching because I had a hemorrhagic stroke June the 11th, 2018. So I had to learn to walk, talk all over again. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> it has been a long journey, but you know what? Thank God he has blessed me with my writing skills and has helped me to put words together in order to create books for children. Oh, man, you're awesome. What an inspiration you are. Thank you. Alexander Kuzmano, a nursing home doctor in Michigan, was inspired by his three boys, ages two, four, and six, to start writing children's books about health and hygiene. This is his second appearance on the Page Publishing Book Club. Now, your first book, Timothy and the Tartar Trolls, helps kids understand why they have to brush their teeth. Now we have Ophelia and the onerous onychomycosis. That's the fancy term for nail fungus. Do kids get nail fungus? They do, surprisingly. You know, it's not as bad as adults when they get it, but sometimes they can get it. I just thought this one would be more of a fun idea. I see a lot of it in my my daily practice. Sometimes when their grandkids are are visiting with them, sometimes I do hear them asking questions about grandma and grandpa's nails, why they look so much different than their nails. So yeah, as we get older, just, you know, unfortunately... Our nails are bigger, and, you know, as we get a lot older, we don't wash as much as we do when we're younger. So, basically about a a little girl named Ophelia, and, uh, you know, she's very hygienic, washes her hands all the time, doesn't dig in the dirt, unlike her brother. But she notices she got some, she has something odd on her nail one day, and and then she freaks out about it, and uh, she finds out she has nail fungus. So then she, uh, you know, imagines the worst that she's got mushrooms and things growing on her her fingernail, and it's going to destroy her pretty nails. And then the doctor talks to her about it and tells her, you know, to have a special nail polish for a while, and you know, so then that, that calms her down, and you know, and she's worried that no one's going to want to be around her in the meantime. Is it as simple as putting a little yeah. nail polish on it? Correct, yes. And at the, at the end we see she gets cured um, and her nails are back to their normal good looks. So the good news for Ophelia is because she's young and her immune mm-hmm. system is healthy, that her mm-hmm. nails, she can fight the fungus. That's right. <laughs> so do you, when, when little kids come to visit their grandparents, do you hand them a book? Oh, <laughs> that, that would be a, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll start doing that.
Uh, we did a book fair. Uh, we've handed out some complimentary copies, uh, friends and family, you know, some social media. My wife, you know, does uh, po- does some posts on Facebook. Um, you know, I'm looking at doing, uh, yeah, maybe some uh, book signings, some advertisements at, the, you know, the local bookstore, uh, that sort of thing. All right, Alexander, that's the way to do it. We have to take a quick break, but we're coming right back. Stay with us. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Teresa Guante suffered a parent's worst nightmare when her 25-year-old son was shot and killed by a friend in Boston. She was encouraged to write poems to help her deal with her unspeakable grief. And once she started sharing them, she was inspired to publish her book entitled Words from a Broken Heart. Um, Basically, the book is about my everyday struggle through the pain of losing my son, it gives people an idea of what my life is day to day and what my struggles are with the pain. I don't mention anything prior to the shooting. The poems are all based on the feelings and all the emotions that I was dealing with on a daily basis after the loss of Shannon. It's not a story. It's it, it's poetry that I wrote. There were days that I was writing poem on a daily basis, or sometimes it might have been, you know, during the holidays, or if there was some type of mild milestone that I was going through. Um, so the poems are based on, you know, things of that nature. Um, my goal is to help other parents because I know that a lot of parents struggle with communicating how they feel and, you know, how to get those emotions out. When I originally started writing the poems, I was sharing some of them. I started sharing some of them with the uh, women in the parents grief group um, that I go to. And they were the ones that encouraged me to write the book, to share, you know, my experience and to share my words with other parents. Um, But that was not the only goal. The goal uh, of this book was not only to share my daily struggle, but I also want to use a proceed, uh, some of the proceeds from the book so I can start a foundation in Shannon's honor to help other parents with funeral services because that was one of the challenges that I had as a parent after losing Shannon. And I was fortunate to have friends and family that were able to help out financially because as a parent, you're never prepared to, of course, lose a child. And financially, um, I was not able to do it myself. Shannon was 25 at the time, and I had him on my um, insurance policy, but because he had just turned 25, he was considered an adult, and he can have his own policy, so he was dropped from my insurance, and financially, I couldn't afford to bury my child, so I had to count on family and friends to help me out, so I am hoping and praying that this book will be a success. So I can help other families. Teresa, my heart goes out to you. Thank you so much. Lane Arnold and his wife were youth ministers outside Houston for 22 years, and now they've started their own church and mission to guide and bring hope to our future, our children. The name of his book, Influencing Generation Next. What other better purpose is there than to make a good impact in the next generation? Our young people Right now, they're just a percentage of our society, but they're 100% of our future. I mean, 99.9% of adults, they have a God-given instinct to leave this world a better place. And this book 
is just giving a few keys of how to be able to communicate and, and share your heart and share your passions and actually get through to the next generation so that they can get it. Hey, what is life all about? You know, how can I make a difference? And why am I here? What are my gifts? What is my destiny? Because sometimes we're talking two different languages, you know, and this book is kind of like how to meet in the middle and really influence them and give them things that we've learned along the way that they desperately need, but they don't even know that they need. But, you know, you talk about the 10 timeless keys of influence. One of the keys is to listen and not just to sit down and, and hear. Listening and hearing are two different things. When you lend your ear, you literally give them a voice. Keys like passion, you know, the passion in music is a universal language. And when when the generation sees something to be passionate about, they'll follow in on that. But when you're passionate about doing something right and helping, then they will be more susceptible to be influenced by you. Um, it's about truly loving them and making sure they know and understand that, hey, this guy, this girl, this person is not, hasn't given up on me. Now, the key is like faithfulness and being there on a day to day basis. But you just get into their world and then you redirect them after you lend your ear and you actually prove to them that you care about them, then they'll start to open their heart to things that you may want to help them out and pour into them to help them fulfill their destiny and be all they are created to be. And one of the main statements is, hey, life is not a 40-yard dash, but it's also not a marathon. It's a relay. But the most important part of a relay is the handoff. And what is this life all about? It's, it's about making this world a better place and we were created by our god to make this world a better place for the next generation to live nice message lane thank you vicki west takes care of her mom in texas and writes she wrote poetry as a child and about 20 years ago she got hooked on script writing and her book entitled switch bait was originally a movie script well it's about a successful new york fashion designer that decides that she wants to branch out and she goes to california to do fashion shows and she winds up meeting an ex-boyfriend from college and he's in some trouble and he's you know going through a divorce and his career is kind of crashing he's getting older and it's he's kind of like an alcoholic you know they finish in a show and coming out and he's you know like outside running naked and he's drunk and so she's like surprised you know because she doesn't really expect the meeting but they were so close back in college so she decides well she's going to try to help him and try to get it where it doesn't mess up his reputation even though you know you know there's people out there and everybody's seeing it you know it's kind of like a setup because they knew she was there or he knew she was there but she doesn't know that and she goes to help him and then she's the one that's really the one in trouble so um, she had to deal with some bad people and get away from them, too. You know, he's messed up with the bad people that uh, can have a scheme in, in the sense to uh, rip her off, get in there, take her money and stuff like that. And she's thinking that he's just an alcoholic going through bad times, and she doesn't realize he's hooked up with the bad people. And then she's wanting to save him because she still has feelings for him. She's also now she's in a predicament where she has to get herself out of trouble. Okay. It's a crime mystery. When you get into it, you're thinking they're trying to take over her business when it's not. You know, it's it's basically about greed. You kind of get surprised about who, who the main villain is. And you're thinking it's someone else when it's not. <laughs> so it, it kind of throws a little twist in and out as you go along. All right, Vicki. Thank you. Finally, Robert Glick, an artist and writer, wants all of us to experience the majesty of being present in any given moment. He tells us how in his book entitled Quantum Sense, How to Ally with Change, Growth, and Creativity. Um, I think the central message is one of, of hope that we can improve our lives by working with uh, nature's creative uh, engine. That kind of begs the question, you know, what, what really is creativity? And I knew when I wrote the book that I was embarking on a very, very complex narrative that would, you know, take me from the building blocks of nature's generative process or generative engine, described in part by quantum mechanics to lifelong functions about the human condition. Uh, it's about what happens to people when they uh, engage the creative process. Um, and that's what kind of runs to the sense of primacy, what I call it. So being in the moment, right? And what people can learn by uh, engaging the creative process. 
And the book is about more than that because when I wanted, when I wanted to write a book about creativity, I, you know, I became immensely aware of of the question: what really is creativity? And to do that, I've always had an interest in nature's uh, generative process: what causes things to move forward, to for people to grow um, and, and connect. And so that caused me to look into things like quantum mechanics, uh, quantum physics, uh, neuroscience, and um, how people really, in real time and in real life, can, at any point in time, um, engage the, uh, the creative process to their own benefit. Do you tell people how to do that in the book? I do, indeed, yeah. I offer 10 key lessons that can be learned uh, by seeing the world as a state rather than, than a condition of being, which is something that happens during the creative process. But, you know, I also, as a, as a specific example, write about what's called flow. Um, uh, done research in the signature brainwave patterns that occur when high performers enter into what, what some of them call flow, which is basically an intense state of being when the subject is completely lost in the, in the moment, Okay. And so I write about the fact that during flow, our perceptions about what's happening to us are altered. And I go into the scientific basis for for that happening. And it basically occurs when when someone encounters a challenge that's interesting enough to suspend at least some parts of our very sophisticated mental motifs in favor of dealing with the immediate task at hand. It's a challenging subject, as you can tell, but it is a self-help book. And so it's intended for academics, it's for artists, people who are interested in the creative process in general. So L.A., I would say Santa Monica in particular, um, San Diego, La Jolla in particular. Um, you know, there, there are areas where people are just really, really interested in thought, especially as it pertains to how can I... Um, uh, activate um, uh, these uh, these systems that can improve my life. All right, Robert, you sure did your homework. I'll give you that. Thanks so much. Listen, that is a wrap for this edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. Thanks for joining us. If you missed anything, just go to 710WOR.com and download the podcast. Otherwise, I ask you, what have you written lately? And if not now, when? Something to think about. Talk at you next time. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. 